It's often said imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, which is probably why many investors try to model their portfolios around what a Warren Buffett, Rakesh Junjunwala, or Monish Pabrai are investing in. In fact, Mr. Pabrai openly admits to be a Buffett cloner and confesses to have copied many parts of his investing framework and partnership structure. In fact, a study was conducted in 2008 where Berkshire Hathaway's entire equity holdings was cloned over a 31-year period. The compiled data shows that if an investor had simply mimicked this portfolio, then he or she would have beaten the benchmark in most years and would have exceeded the S&P 500 by 11% on an average. An 11% alpha is something to die for and Buffett did that over 30 years which somewhat proves the adage, shameless cloning works. But it works best when you clone the best. And so in this video, we shall direct our attention to one of the world's most revered money managers as I look to replicate what Peter Lynch has done so efficiently and profitably for many years. My research will focus on the Indian stock market as we look to extract a list of domestic stocks on the basis of Peter's way of investing. I think you'll like this video, so let's begin. Peter Lynch's investing strategy is detailed in these two books. One Upon Wall Street and Beating the Street. Now I've read these books a few times and I think his investment approach can be broken into three simple parts. One, a compelling story. Two, how should one build their portfolio? And third, how to select the ideal stocks. Let's start with point one. And Peter Lynch is someone whom we can call a story investor. A story from a company standpoint revolves around two things. One, what is the company going to do in the future? And number two, what is going to happen as a result of it? Now, if the story is good, that is the company has high growth expectations then qualifies for a potential Peter Lynch stock. Of course, getting the story right is no easy task and investors have to be familiar with the company, the industry, strengths, the competition, the valuation, etc. A lot like how we analyzed the life insurance industry in a previous video. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, then kindly do so because A, it's free and B, you don't want to miss out on more videos like the ones we've already posted, like identifying coffee can stocks, finding cash rich companies at attractive valuations and a simple small cap strategy that can potentially jump up your returns by 16% or more. But stories can be deceptive and to have a better understanding, Peter Lynch categorizes them into six major storylines. So there are slow growing companies, the large but growing stalwarts, fast aggressively growing companies which are amongst his favorites. And then there were the more tactically oriented cyclicals, the comeback kings or turnarounds. And of course, asset plays which completed the entire story metaphorically speaking. The second pillar of Peter Lynch's investment strategy is around portfolio building and its monitoring. While Peter Lynch was not a buy and hold person, he did strongly advocate a long term commitment to the stock markets, which means his strategy actually borders more on practicality and he's pretty okay with investors rotating companies depending on market conditions. In fact, Peter Lynch encourages investors to pick stocks across different sectors and to also review one's holdings every few months to verify if the company's story is still intact or there has been any dramatic changes in the investment thesis. The third and final pillar of Peter Lynch's investment approach is his stock selection criteria. And thanks to these two books, I found eight areas that need to be factored when searching for fast growing companies. The first is market capitalization and Peter Lynch has a preference for small cap companies because of their longer growth runway. In fact, he used to say this and I quote, big companies have small moves and small companies have big moves. Now, Mr. Lynch doesn't define in his book what's the minimum or maximum size of a small company. But from an Indian context, let's assume this would be between 500 and 15,000 crores, which would give us about 1,000 small cap companies to work with. The second selection criteria is the price earning multiple or the P ratio. Now, an important metric like this cannot be looked at in isolation, which is why Peter Lynch prefers to study it over several years along with its industry average to see if the company is indeed a bargain. And therefore, we'll be applying two filters in our stock selection criteria. The first one requiring the current P ratio to be lower than the company's own five year average P ratio. 
And the second filter is to have the company's current P ratio to be lower than the industry P ratio. The third criteria is earnings growth. And there is some confusion here with many articles preferring growth in net profits and others leaning towards growth in earnings per share. But irrespective, Peter Lynch prefers companies that are growing their earnings at a rate of 15 to 25 percent. And that's what we'll do in our selection criteria as we seek out companies with a five year net profit CAGR of at least 15 percent. So I've been working the numbers and after applying the market cap filter, it gives me a sufficiently large universe of 1040 companies. Once I apply the two P ratio filters, that is the industry P and the historical five year average P, this universe shrinks down even further to 234 companies. And the 15% earnings rule gets us down to just 123 companies. Now many investors like to add or subtract filters on top of the ones that we've already discussed. For example, if I were to add a return on capital employed filter of 15%, then my list of companies will shrink even further from 123 to 86 companies. But before doing anything of this sort, let's go back to the remaining stock selection criteria. The fourth selection criteria and an important one is the P to earnings growth ratio, which is otherwise known as the PEG ratio. To understand this, let's look at three companies from three different industries. Infosys Limited, Ultratech Cement and Hindustan Unilever. Now Infosys is currently at a price earning ratio of 28.6 and averages an earnings growth of about 10%. So 28.6 divided by 10 gives us a peg ratio of almost 2.9. Similarly, Ultratech and HUL have a peg ratio of 2.5 and 4.7 respectively. So two things here. Firstly, while a comparison of P ratios between these three companies would have made no sense as they are from different industries, the PEG ratio was able to bring them together on a uniform measurement scale. And secondly, a number like 2.9, 2.5, 4.7 is something Peter Lynch would not have approved of as a part of his own stock selection screener. In fact, in his book, he says, and I quote, the P ratio of any company that's fairly priced will be equal to its growth rate, which is another way of saying that companies which are at a peg ratio of less than one are generally undervalued. In fact, Peter Lynch employs a slightly modified version of the peg ratio, which is a dividend adjusted peg ratio or PEGI for short. And as was the case with the peg ratio, companies with a PEGI of less than one are flagged as undervalued. So in a screener, I have taken a slightly conservative PEGI of 0.75, which brings the potential list of companies from 125 to 102. Now, 100 odd companies is a good list to work with. And I think it is at this stage that an investor should come off the screening process and start analyzing every company for its strengths, financials, market share, business risk, competition, etc. All right, so point five is about having a strong balance sheet. And Peter Lynch is particularly referring to the amount of debt in the company's books. This is where a debt ratio of less than 25% is recommended, but this need not be a firm rule. For example, this 25% rule need not be applied in financial companies like banks and NBFCs, and also in capital intensive industries like power, transport, steel, etc., where companies anyways carry a lot of debt. The sixth criteria is institutional ownership, and Peter Lynch has a preference for companies where this number is bit on the low side. So as a filter, we are looking for companies where the combined percentage of domestic and foreign institutional holding is less than 20%. And finally, the seventh and eighth criteria is based on Peter Lynch's experience, where he lists out the kind of businesses that he prefers and generally avoids. But remember, he said that in the 1970s, 80s and 90s. So some of these points might sound a little odd in 2022, but here we go. In terms of favorable characteristics, Lynch preferred companies with a boring name, companies that are operating in a boring industry, idly a spin-off because these receive little attention, niche companies that control large parts of the market, companies whose products are always in demand and if there is any insider buying that's happening with the stock. Similarly, some characteristics Lynch doesn't find favor with include going after hot stocks in hot industries, companies with big unproven plans, profitable companies who are diversifying via acquisitions, which he also calls diversification, 
and where one customer accounts for 25% to 50% of sales, etc. So these eight strategies form the basis of Peter Lynch's stock selection. And if done well, then these can form the basis of your small cap multi-packer strategy. All right, now let's apply what we have learned so far in a stock screener. So I'm using screener.in here, and this is the closest I could get to Peter Lynch's stock selection formula. I've incorporated six of the eight filters, leaving aside only 0.7 and 8, which were more preference-based and a bit subjective. This gives us a grand total of 32 companies, which is way lower than the 1,000 plus companies we had when we first started by filtering the small cap companies. Now, outside of the market cap, P ratio, etc., which are anyways a part of the selection criteria, I found a number of interesting characteristics. For instance, the median EV to EBITDA, which is a valuation metric I dearly follow, was a mouth-watering 5.1. Likewise, the 32 companies had a median five-year sales growth of 12.5%, an operating margin of 17.2%, etc. In fact, I was a little surprised and I'm still in a bit of shock when I figured that this small portfolio of 32 stocks had delivered a three-year CAGR of 46% and a five-year CAGR of almost 20%. So there seems to be strength in this process and for your benefit, I have attached the screener link in the video's description for you to dabble with it. I also came across a screener on equitymaster.com and a few articles on Economic Times. Those links have also been attached in the video's description. So to sum it up, Peter Lynch offers a practical approach to investing that can be adapted by different investors to suit their needs. What we have discussed today is suitable for investors who prefer fast growing companies that are available at reasonable valuations. But I don't want a screener to de-emphasize perhaps the most important point of his strategy, which involves considerable hands-on research, focused fundamental analysis, multiple and regular iterations, and his long-term commitment to the stock market. I sincerely hope you will use this presentation to improve your own investing strategy. And if you have any questions, please type them in the comment section. Once again, thank you for your time. Do like this video, do subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you next week. Until then.